This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Kelly Holland. Kelly is the founder and CEO of Own Your Destiny, which provides financial coaching and empowerment programs to help women gain the confidence and knowledge they need to achieve well-being and live life on their terms. Who doesn't want to do that? She blends her knowledge of finance and with communications expertise developed over two decades as an award-winning business and personal finance journalist with the New York Times, Business Week, and gosh, do I miss Business Week. I was a loyal reader, and CNBC. She joins me today to discuss her book, You Are Worthy, Change Your Money Mindset, Build Your Wealth, and Find Your Future. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Kelly. Thank you, Mike. It's so great to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you here, and I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody as we begin, which is, Kelly, where does your story as an author begin? So it has a couple of roots. Um, if you think of it as a braid, uh, one braid would be my mother, who did a ton of work, um, decades of work during her lifetime uh, for women's empowerment in various forms, primarily healthcare, but um, but many forms. And my father, who was an English professor, so writing, creative, but by all means writing, and uh, who had, and I could tell from the minute I could read his books or at least string words together and maybe not figure out all the literary criticism but you know he had this incredibly readable style especially for an academic it just felt that he was talking to you so that was I always sort of saw the power of um, just explaining through writing that way and then the third piece was of my own devising and it was actually a moment in time um, <clears throat> I'm going to take you to a stoplight in Bridgeport, Connecticut, when I was 21. And there I was in my car, my first car headed to my first job. And I looked down at the gas gauge and I was pretty darn near empty. And I realized that I was going to have to coast down the little slope to my office um, if I wanted to make it to work so that I could pick up the paycheck that I needed to put gas in the car. I was literally out of gas. Yeah. So nice metaphor there, right? For I was going to say your your car is running on fumes and your and your your wallet's <laughs> running on fumes as well. It was so running on fumes. So um, you know that resolved itself. I got to work. I got paid. I put gas in my car, and it certainly wasn't the last of my financial mistakes. Far from it. But um, but what the the thing that stayed with me in that moment was the feeling of. Kelly, you're such a failure. Like, how did you let yourself do this? What's wrong with you? And that remained the way I thought about myself in relation to money for many years, even as I went on and went to business school and worked on Wall Street and did all these things where you would think, I mean, that it, I clearly had more than enough book learning, if you will, to take care of this stuff. But I just, in my own personal life, it just wasn't happening. Um, so that was a piece of it. As I said, I did go to business school. I did really like investment management in business school. I did work on Wall Street and then I became a business and financial journalist. So that's the third part of the braid is that money piece, my own little um, pothole, if you will. And then the, um, the journalism career that way and where it all wove together braided together was when I started writing about personal finance and uh, realized that the challenges that I had had as a 20 something were not unique to me and they were not the result of some personal failing, but they were something that a lot of women come up against and not only women, but it often happens to women that they feel um, kind of unwelcome in the world of money. They feel sort of predisposed to be bad at it. And that that sort of mindset makes it really hard for us to bring our A game when we are confronted with things like the gender pay gap or the fact that we spend more time out of work and the other things that happen to women. So that's where my idea for, um, for the coaching practice began was this idea that I could help women, not just with the learning. I was doing that already as a journalist, but with the mindset. 
And so that's the coaching practice. It's all around changing your mindset so that you can build the skills and take charge and use what is essentially a tool for living. No more, no less. And the book is an outgrowth of all of that. My practice, my working with women, a research project where I spoke to over a hundred women. And then of course, this, um, these lessons from my parents around writing and writing that really reaches people and of course, empowering women. So it kind of all wove together into um, what it is today. Yeah. I mean, I have to ask, cause you mentioned Bridgeport. Um, where were you working in Bridgeport, Connecticut? I was working for General Electric. I was a trainee in their financial management training program. So there, again, like I'm learning finance and I'm running out of gas. So it, there was a whole lot of shame around this whole thing. Yeah, no, you I, know I, Bridgeport? I do. Well, I, I live in Stanford. That's oh. where that's where I'm sitting right now. My daughter okay. goes to Sacred Heart University. Oh, okay. New is New in the North. business school there, and their business school is located in GE's old headquarters, right on Easton Turnpike, right? Uh huh. Uh-huh. So, yeah, we, we, we know GE well. Um, yep. Yeah. All so, of Connecticut knows GE well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, not, not so much anymore since they left, yeah. but um, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, what are what are the biggest mistakes, you know, you you see, um, you know, women making in, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of money um, and in terms of achieving financial well-being, mm-hmm. uh, you mm-hmm. know, in, in your coaching practice and your expertise, you know, what, you know, what are the... Um, what are the big watch outs? Um, well, there is, I mean, first and foremost, I would say, and it's not a mistake, but it's a hurdle. And that is this mindset. And there's a reason that so many women develop this mindset. I mean, we start out often, many of us receive less financial education from our parents than our brothers do. Mm. You know, there are all these sort of social messages all the time, media and advertisements and everything that sort of suggest women are bad with money, chronic overspenders. I mean, if you just did an image search on Google for investor, you might find one woman among the 15 yeah. men. It's just, it's there's messaging out there all the time. Um, and uh, so so we have this, this you know, we, we're, we are receiving messages a lot that we're sort of not good in this space. And so a lot of us uh, wind up internalizing that at least for some period of time Mm -hmm. and it becomes a point of pain. And so we put it away. And then when you ignore your money, like yours truly at age 21, problems happen and then it's more painful and the cycle repeats. So that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call any of that. That's not a mistake, but it's, it's a challenge that comes up. And I would say uh, things follow from that. So Things that can follow are a sense of overwhelm that I don't even know how to start taking charge of my money. So I just, I'm paralyzed. So that would be one. And then another follow on related is um, not investing as much as would make sense given our lifespans and our relative to often relative to men limited years in the workplace. So those would be those would be a few, but I don't like to call them mistakes so yeah. much as uh, challenges. Yeah, no, I did, and, and my my bad for uh, characterizing them as mistakes, but um, it, certainly there is a, a societal um, a societal issue, a cultural issue there, and it it becomes it sounds like it becomes a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you internalize this message that I'm bad with money then you, you almost make that a reality um, until you kind of reframe reframe your thinking a bit. Yes, I think that's true. And I, some of the most interesting research I've read in this area is not even related to finance, but it's just about um, fixed and growth mindsets. Do you know the work of Carol Dweck around just that when you think about uh, your you know, your skill set or your abilities in an area as something that's not static, that's not preordained, um, you can approach that area with more energy and focus and determination. So uh, I really try and help clients get from that fixed mindset around money to more of a growth way of thinking about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, money may only be one, you know, one aspect of their life where they might need a little help in coaching. And there's a, uh, right. you know, one, one, one spoke in the, uh, in the wheel, so to speak. It is one spoke in the wheel, but it's, it's a big one. I mean, really at the end of the day, I think I like to think of money as an essential tool for living. Mm-hmm. And that's really it. I mean, it, for most of us, Money per se is not an end in itself. Nobody's sitting around like, you know, who was the cartoon character who had those stacks of gold coins. So we're, you know, that's not really the point, right? Another, there's a saying, if you die rich, you die poor, right? I mean, money, having money is not, 
an end in itself so much as what money can do for us. So right. um, maybe that's a private jet, but for many more people, it's probably a house that's big enough for the grandkids to visit or um, you know, supporting a charity or sending grandkids to college or life goals like that, seeing yeah. the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, I think it's a means so to an us, end. It's a means to an end, but so many of us get caught up in the pursuit of it, I think, yes. especially, you know, where I'm sitting in Fairfield County, Connecticut, you yes. know, home of like hedge funds. Um, You're you know, deep and, in the Gold Coast. I knew a lot of uh, women who I we used to characterize as finance widows. You know, their husbands were were gone, you know, 80 plus hours a week doing whatever it is they do, because it's a world I don't fully understand all that much since I studied marketing and psychology. But um, <laughs> I often I often joke with my wife. I'm like, you know what? You may have been better off, you know, marrying a finance guy. And she's like, no, I, I don't think we've had nearly as many laughs in our life. But um, it's probably something to that. She's not wrong. No, I know she's not wrong because none of those people I would characterize as being very happy. Um, so this is another thing that comes up though sometimes for women around money mindsets is this whole idea like is, is, is money a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I have love-hate relationship. Is it the root of all evil? Like ascribing these things to it. And, and it's, again, it's a tool. It's yeah. not good. I mean, unless, unless you allow um, your thoughts about money or your energy is directed toward money to take over a disproportionate part of your life, it's not good or bad for you. It's just a tool. I mean, it's honestly analogous to a bicycle or my new Blue Yeti microphone. Oops, yeah. Product placement. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It's all right. <laughs> you can say Blue Yeti as often as you like. Um, maybe they'll sponsor me someday. I don't know. Maybe. I'm probably not because I don't use their product. Uh, <laughs> but if they sent me a free one, maybe. Um, but I also, you know, imagine there's also some some challenges as well, um, uh, you know, with with single mothers in particular, um, you know, having to uh, pause their careers or, um, you know, just, you know, there, there's uh, there's just more challenges, um, you know, with with child care and what happens when somebody gets sick and there's a lot more responsibility on their shoulders uh, and maybe not even true of just single mothers, but just kind of working mothers in general. Um, thoughts on that? More than uh, years ago, more than I would say wealthy women. Um, more than I, I would say men, I would, you know, okay. I, I would argue. So uh, single mothers uh, are generally uh, the women they are often highly, you know, re I'm going to say this wrong. Single mothers are, um, they do face enormous, you know, significant financial challenges. I mean, a lot depends on how much support they are or aren't getting from dad. Um, often it's not what it should be. Uh, women tend to fare worse in divorce if they're single as a result of divorce. Um, and women general statistically women face a motherhood penalty in wages so that when when they have a child they tend to be on a you know they they wind up on a different pay track than their husband who tends to wind up on a higher pay track because you know now he's a responsible guy he's a dad but for the mother it's i mean think about it women are the ones who get the question how do you do it all yeah it just doesn't flow the other way. So, for, so single mothers have a lot of special challenges also because, you know, they are taking this responsibility that, you know, could easily go be spread between two people. They're taking it on themselves to at least some degree. And, um, and they're also contending with the wage gap and everything else. Yeah. I'm just looking at the, the cover of your book right behind, mm -hmm. right over your shoulder. Um, you know, what strikes me is just big, bold print. You are worthy. Um, and you know, you could, you know, um, use that certainly in, um, in, in a money sense, you know, you're worthy of having that life you want, but it's, 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 it's a very broad statement. How did you, how did you land on that as the sort of the primary title for the book? Well, it's actually also a play on net worth, if you think about it. Oh. So it's self-worth and net worth, because I really believe that in, until you have a solid self-worth around money, sense of self-worth around money until you believe that you are capable of doing these things and that you can build the skills, it's a lot harder to build your net worth. So, so it, it started as a play on that, but it's really, it's really about that. You are worthy of, uh, 
of financial well-being. You deserve it. You yourself are worthy as a person and you can be a net worthy kind of person. So it was all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's, it, it's, it was, it took me a long time to find a title that would encapsulate all that I wanted to convey and people as you did read it. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's a great title because from, from that, once, once you, um, I don't know if I want to use the term stabilize, but you know, once you kind of get it and you put these principles into practice, you can become worthy of just having a, just a more enjoyable life overall. Exactly. Right. Oh, if yeah. you can cross that line to where you have just, you know, you're, you're either making ends meet or a little better. Once you're over that line, life is so much easier, yeah. you know, and it, it's a, there is a point, right. It's like where the rain starts and the rain stops. There is a point above which it's easier and below which it's distinctly harder. Right. Um, so yes, it, and it doesn't take, I mean, if, you know, to the extent you can live below your means, then you can build in a greater cushion and greater protection. And that's always good for our financial peace of mind. I always call it the world's best sleep aid, but you know, you can, you, you know, yes, if you, if you can live on what you earn and save a little and have enough to plan for the future, that is a, a pretty common definition of financial well-being. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's, that's the trick, right? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah that, is, that is the trick. I, you know, speaking, um, I, I went from having zero kids to three kids in the span of three minutes. We Whoa. have, we have triplets and I was all of 27 years old at the time. Oh my! <laughs> and it was, you know, I was not far along in my career, let's say in, in marketing and advertising, um, mm -hmm. which was not necessarily a big wealth builder either that, that, right. that sort of career, um, in a single income household. So, um, you know, that is, I feel like I've always been chasing that, you know, finding that happy medium of, Hey, living on, um, you know, living on kind of what I'm earning uh, mm -hmm. versus, versus future earnings, you know, IE debt. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, now, now with three kids in college, um, with two years to go, it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I tell my wife, I'm like, Hey, look, um, we're not doing anything on this house for a long time until these <laughs> kids are, cause she's always like doing home improvement projects that we shouldn't be doing. And I'm like, Hey, you know, it's when these kids are out of school, then we can talk about it because, mm -hmm. but then we have to like really catch up for retirement because, you know, we're behind the eight ball on that. But that's a trap that I think a lot of us fall into, especially if you start your family's young, it's, um, mm -hmm. and you're not, you know, in, in the, um, top 1%, let's say of income earners. Right. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it is, it is a big challenge. It is a big challenge. It is a big challenge. I mean, it is helpful if you can start with even a little bit of saving in your twenties, yeah. because if you can get that invested, the compounding is incredibly powerful. The earlier you can start yeah, and the less you need to do of it, but easier said than done when you're 27 with triplets. I do. Recognize <laughs> yeah, it's literally running to the bank sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, I know we don't want to give away too, too much of the book because, of course, we want people to read the book. And there's a very good reason why we want uh, we want you to sell more copies of this book. Uh, Kelly, what can you tell us about um, the charity you're supporting with this book? So um, I am all about empowering women and, you know, enabling us to live our fullest lives. And um, and as, so what I'm doing with the book is for every copy that's sold, I'm donating to a charity called CAMFED, the Campaign for Female Education, um, in the amount of a, a day school fees for a girl in sub-Saharan Africa. So well, I'll do it all at once at the end of the year, but, but not, you know, school fee by school fee. But, but the, the point is, every book that's sold sends a girl to school for a day. Every five books sends a girl to school for a week and 180 books pays for a girl to go to school for a year. And that can be life-changing in some of these communities. And these girls can emerge from school. They're not gonna be susceptible to child marriage. They're gonna be able to be leaders in their community and bring other girls along. So it's really, it's about creating that chain so we can all help each other along. Yeah, that's the organization a organization is CAMFED. It's a really wonderful nonprofit. Yeah, that, that is wonderful. And I can envision you um, talking to Oprah about this on Super Soul Sunday one day. <laughs> From your lips, Mike. <laughs> um, well, I always like to uh, to say that uh, this is about getting at the stories behind the story. And and um, one of the ways in which I like to learn a little bit more about my guests is by asking them some questions around pop sure. culture. So I'm curious, Kelly, when you were growing up, what were some of your favorite TV shows when you were a kid? 
Oh my gosh. Uh, I really liked the Brady Bunch. I thought Flo was the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> the Brady Bunch comes up. I mean, if, if I were to do a word cloud of, yeah. of, of shows, the titles of shows, yeah. When I asked that question, Brady Bunch is big, bold, right in the middle. That, oh, and for what? some reason, Gilligan's it? Island. It's people find themselves in that, in one of those characters. Yeah. And it's like this, you know, idyllic, somewhat idyllic life, but also a non traditional life. You know, you're talking about, you know, a divorce, two divorced people getting married, blending their families in the, what was it, the 60s, right? Yes. Um, it was kind of cutting edge for, for TV back then, we may laugh at it now. Right. It was a little cutting edge for, for TV back then. I I think it may have been. I think I liked it because it seems so typical to me. I mean, just in terms of, you know, what they worried about and things like that. It was just so all American. And here I, I was in this family of, you know, eggheads, let's be blunt, right? My dad was an English professor and it was, you know, we had books all over the house and Sunday afternoon, it seemed to always rain and they would always be listening to opera and just making their way through the New York Times for four hours and they would not play board games. And I was like, get me into the Brady Bunch land, please. So, I know, but you know, I'm listening to you say that now, like that's like my ideal Sunday. I no, think, I know. Honestly, now I spend like, Sundays like It's like listening to Italian opera. It would have to be yeah. Italian opera because my yeah. grandmother was Italian. Making, you know, making a Sunday sauce. Right. Um, and, and, you know, then doing a, a crossword puzzle or reading the newspaper, like, yeah. and if it's raining outside, that's even better. It's, it's a great day, right? Like, I would, <laughs> I would enjoy that to no end. No uh, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, back then, you know, like I just, I just wanted my Parcheesi or something. I don't know. And then Mary Tyler Moore, of course, like any good feminist. Right. I loved Mary Tyler Moore. Right. No, she was, she was great. She was great. Yeah. Um, What's your take on Columbo? Did you, did you? Did you oh, get yes. Columbo? Peter Falk. Oh, God. <laughs> one more thing. <laughs> There's one more thing. If he says that to you and asks two follow up questions, or if two follow up, if two questions came before one more thing, you're screwed. Just put the yep. handcuffs on. You're gone. Exactly. You're, That's it. That's he, it. He's got your number. I watch one. I watch it almost every night. Yeah. Um, Great show. And, oh, God. I'll, I'll, and I'll rewatch them too. Yeah. Because they're just that good. And his eyebrows, his eyebrows should have gotten credit, you know. Oh, I agree. I agree. Although I don't think they could remake that show now because of the smoking. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I imagine now he'd have to walk around with like a yogurt or something instead of the cigar. But <laughs> does anybody have a spoon? A smoothie. Or, yeah, one of those grass green smoothies. <laughs> oh, that's great. How about uh, musical artists? Who did you listen to growing up? Uh, um. Let's see. Well, Carol King. Uh, totally identify with Janice Ian on 17. Um, who else? Uh, I was never a full on deadhead, but I did like the dead. I liked mm -hmm. I liked ballads a lot. Um, I adored and still adore Joan Baez, just yeah. her whole persona, um, but also just that voice. Yeah. Johnny yeah. Mitchell. I guess lots of female ballad yeah, singers. Yeah, sounds like it. It's kind of the through like line. It. Yeah, Joni Mitchell. She had a great voice. Oh my god. Oh goodness. my gosh. Did I don't know if you saw her at the or the there. It's on YouTube, but she appeared at the Newport Jazz Festival this summer, and it was oh just really astounding. Yes. Wow. Yeah, she was one of those Laurel like, Canyon, um, you know, yeah. dwellers, right? With Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and I think so. All yes. of those great LA bands or bands yeah. that lived in in the canyon. Yeah. I would love to like get a time machine and just like hang with them for, you know, <laughs> a weekend just to see what, what oh, that no. was like and the creative. I don't know process. if I could survive the psychedelic. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think I could either, but um, I would like to, I would like to, I'd like to just see it, observe oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think just observe the creative, it. just the creative energy flowing around. There was that Beatles series, the documentary that ran. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Last year, uh, it was just fascinating to watch their creative process. So just watching them sit around and, and talk over and, and just work it. Yeah. And then argue and then Yoko's yeah. knitting. I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> that's what <laughs> my takeaway was, wow, Yoko likes to knit. Um, right. But uh, how about this one? Um, you know, I believe, uh, you know, I, I have an artistic soul and I believe I have an inner child. Um, uh, do you feel the same? And if so, how do you feed your inner child? Say more about what you mean by inner child. 
like, do you have like an inner, like, just I, I, the best way to describe it is like we're adults here, but inside of us, you know, there's like that child that wants to be seen and heard and, and paid attention to that wants to be a little bit more frivolous, have some fun, not worry so much about, you know, all the stuff that we adults have to worry about, you know, yeah. maybe wants to play a board game like Parcheesi. Um, you know, do you do you feel like you have an inner child? I yes, I think I do. I have to think. I mean, uh, how do I indulge her? Uh, I probably don't indulge her enough, mm. uh, but I do with my kids. We clown around all the time, um, <laughs> and I just I you know one of the ways I got through writing this book was just endless dance parties in the kitchen late at night. They really. Mm -hmm kept me going that's so. a perfect example that's a perfect yeah. example yeah spending time with uh with the kids doing fun stuff how old are your children well children is probably a misnomer the youngest is 20 <laughs> she's home now before she goes back to her second year at college and then the 23 year old is in idaho where she's a whitewater rafting guide wow and informed us that she recently killed her first this is her words her first rattlesnake so does that mean how many more are on the agenda here? I don't know, but if I were a rattlesnake, I'd be worried. I'll just say that. I, I, I don't do snakes. Um, no. I'll be honest. No. I do not like no. them. They, they have no place in my life. No, no, they belong far, far away. Uh, and then my son is about to be 26 and he's going to start graduate school on Monday. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. Very cool. Uh, very cool. Um, yeah. Where do you live? Where do you reside? I'm in New Jersey. Ah, Jersey. Lovely yeah. Jersey. I'll yeah, be there. I'll be to. there on Wednesday. <laughs> Sorry to hear it. <laughs> now, I have a project where I'm interviewing uh, people about um, dog collars. So oh, interesting. It's exciting. It's exciting. What about dog collars? Well, it's uh, I've been hired by a company to do some product development research on a uh, on a new type of dog collar, okay. um, a smart collar, if you will. Yeah. I can point you to a couple dog parks if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, do you view uh, writing as being therapeutic at all? Sometimes. How so? Sometimes. I think, I don't know. It may be different for fiction writers. They may be working through more interior things, <laughs> but I think it it's, it's therapeutic for me in that it's a really great way to sort through a tangle of ideas mm -hmm. and to make them make sense together. So when I'm disciplined about structuring things, I know that's the antithesis of working through problems, but when I'm, when I'm, when I'm structuring things, it helps me think in a more logical way. Sometimes if I'm having a complicated reaction to something yeah. uh, I've, I've journaled off and on, not on any consistent basis, but around, you know, like more trying times around things like, you know, just different trying times I've journaled, I journaled when my son was born and it, it, yes. I mean, that helps you think through and clarify and crystallize Yeah. important moments. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And also for you, if I'm putting my Freudian hat on for a second, um, you know, you're, uh, you got your father who was the English professor and writer and your mother who was, you know, helping, helping women and, and, um, and those two worlds kind of come together for you when you're writing. It sounds yes, like. very so much so. You've got some, maybe some subconscious, you know, um, parent stuff, you know? Oh, it's, it's no, very much. I think it's very much bringing together the two sides. And one way I've thought, I mean, when I went into coaching, it was a departure for me in that my whole career until then had been really quite um, head focused as opposed to heart focused. So, yeah. right. I was, I was a, journalist so there's it's it's creative ish but it, it can't be too creative like you're working with facts right, right. it's you creative and the design and how you tell the story but but um and I was writing about banking and finance and markets and those kinds of things so it wasn't uh, you know I wasn't on the education beat or something like yeah. that so or the or arts but um uh so, so when I learned got my coach training and started coaching I really had to sort of develop and be comfortable with expressing that heart side of myself and so yes it does bring those two things together because I would think in you know if I think about my parents my mother would have they're both really smart they're both you know warm people but I, my mother was sort of the overtly heart one and my father was definitely the egghead yeah. so yes it brought those two together yeah no very uh 
Very cool. Um, how do you feel when you're staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank sheet of paper, computer screen, you know, depending on how you write and you need to write something. What does a blank page do for you? I just start. I just start. I don't give it a lot of thought. I mean, I, I don't know if that's I, I think that's probably all those years in journalism. You cannot mm. writer's block is simply not an option. Right. I had in uh, an early job. I was writing for trade publication about uh, banking and I was writing about uh, certain, you know, some capital mar- like uh, cap- capital markets that banks use, financial markets that banks use. Okay, so these markets closed at four o'clock. Well, our paper, our every weekday paper, closed. We had to file stories by three thirty. And you know, I was writing about the market. I mean, you can't. I mean, you were up to the minute, and you just had to get it done. It just wasn't, you know, you it, there was no option to stare at a blank page. Yeah. So I think, I think for me, it's just an invitation to get busy. Yeah. Um, how, how do you feel becoming a coach has changed your life? I think it has helped me be more in touch with my empathic side. It has helped me be more receptive to ideas around um, or be more aware of, you know, the, the research around things like happiness and mental well-being and mindset and all those things, which I think can help all of us, quite honestly, when you think and you're methodical and intentional about ways to just increase your what Sonia Lubomirsky calls your happiness set point. It just it it shows up in, in your whole life. So that on a personal level, that's how it's helped me. But I mean, I guess also on a personal personal and professional level, it's just been a joy to see these direct concrete results. It's very different from journalism in that you write something, it goes out into the world and you hope it helps and you know if it gets a a big reaction, but it's not the same. You're direct with the readers, but this is much more proximate. Yeah. So as Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative says like it's, it's about getting proximate and really feeling humanity up close. Yeah, feeling humanity up close, and you're 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 helping to change lives. So that's I'm uh, trying. That's it's got to be uh, soul feeding, if you will. Well, that's I I hope so, and I hope it's feeding other women's souls. It, I mean, I do I do also talk in the book about how we can teach our children, our daughters, our children, the other women we're close to about these things once we master them. And so I really it's I'm, I'm on a bit of a mission to sort of open up this world for women, make it welcoming, make it available because we have, if we can take charge of our money, there is so much we can do for the world. Yeah. And I want to help make that happen. Yeah. And uh, one, one final question for you. Um, If you are, if you can imagine sitting um, in, in the riding shotgun, if you will, uh, (laughs) with the younger Kelly, whose car and wallet were on (laughs) fumes. Right. You're I don't coasting. recommend riding shotgun with me when I was 21. Let's be clear. But you're you're coasting down the hill in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Right. Um, what what one lesson from your book would you whisper into her ear? And just to, just to give her a little bit of a, you know, just give her a little bit of a education. I think I'd say you can do this. You know more than you think you do. You deserve this, and it's within your reach. Trust yourself, take your time, and you can get to a better place. Yeah. You know, I that this question I, I always am always um fascinated by the the answers I get to that question. Cause I ask it of almost everybody. You know, I call it my back to the future question, whisper some pieces of advice. However, do you think that if if you didn't have those experiences, mm-hmm. do you think you'd be you'd be talking to me right now about this book that you've written? Not at all. No. Yeah. No. No, and I could have easily gone through life just feeling like, you know, there's, I just academically or intellectually, I knew what to do with money and I could write about what to do with money. I could write about investing in capital markets and even derivatives, but, um, but personally I could be a mess and not pay my bills on time and never invest and, you know, just, just underserve myself. Um, so it was, I think, I, you know, it, no, I mean, because part of my history too is just developing motivation to change, which is a key part of what makes it possible for us to take charge. It's really locking in on our own personal, deep, heartfelt motivation. And then 
you're willing to do the things to make that come to fruition. Yeah. Um, so I think, no, I, I had to live through all those experiences and get the distance to reflect on them to be able to be here. Yeah. You're so right about the motivation to change because if, if, if you're not really bought into this idea that I want to make a change in my life, right. everything anyone tells you, it's just going to fall on deaf ears or, or you'll give it surface level. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Or in drops the thing of I can't, or it'll never happen for me. So right. yes, but you can, you can make change. You can, and, you can and you're worthy motivation. and you are and worthy. You're worthy <laughs> and you're worthy. Well, we've been talking to Kelly Holland, who uh, has written a book called You Are Worthy, Change Your Money Mindset, Build Your Wealth, and Fund Your Future. Kelly, where can people pick up this book? I imagine there's a few people who want to help you send uh, girls in sub-Saharan Africa to school. What a great idea. So it'll be on sale September 20th, wherever books are sold. And if you want updates, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, which is www.kellyholland.com. And you can also follow me on LinkedIn. And then I also spend a fair bit of time on Twitter at K Kelly Holland. And yeah, that's, those are my primary points right. of usage. There we Point go. Contact. We'll, we'll be sure to put those in the show notes. So uh, you can all, all of you listening can get in touch with Kelly and follow her. Well, please on, do. Yes. I'm sure she would. Uh, you're worthy of following Kelly. Everyone listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen to my words right here. You are worthy of following Kelly. Yes, Kelly, you This has been a uh, enlightening and fun conversation. Thank you very much for stopping by. And Thank you story. for having me, Mike. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.